This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, host of Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking. Join the conversation every Tuesday at 11 as we dissect issues that are important to you and your family. That's Relatively Speaking, Tuesdays only on MPB Think Radio. Good morning and welcome to Southern Remedy from MPB Think Radio. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics, and this is your program, your Southern Remedy program, where you can call in with any type of question that you might have. We're going to try to answer it this morning for you. You can always email us. That email address is remedy at mpbonline.org. Great weather outside this morning, although I've started to see a little bit of pollen. I uh, noticed that on my car yesterday. I was like, oh, it's here. It sneaks up on us really quick. Although uh, with all the pine trees that have uh, been uh, uh, taken out last summer by the drought, it uh, looks like we might have less pine pollen. But just to let you know, other pollens, even pollens you can't see are out there right now. Trees are, you can just look up in the trees and you can see the pollen uh, uh, fronds. That's not the exact word. That's the only word that comes to my mind right now this morning. But uh, but, but they, you can see the, the pollen apparatus that's on the trees. Um, so if you are uh, suffering from allergies like myself, just take some precautions during this time. You might need to ramp up your strategy so you don't uh, just have a miserable time because the weather is absolutely gorgeous out there. So hopefully you can take advantage of that today. This is Southern Remedy. The number to call if you have a question about anything could be a new um, new symptom that you might have or just something that you want to call in about. Maybe it's a new medication or a potential side effect. I'm going to go to our first caller now. This is Jim from Picayune. Good morning, Jim. Uh, good morning, Dr. Stewart. Uh, I'm a... Uh... 69, and I have tinnitus for about two years. I, I was a truck driver for many years, and uh, a doctor said I have mild hearing loss. And sometimes it's quiet, sometimes loud, but the last uh, couple of weeks it's been getting very loud. And with the TV on and trying to make out with what my wife is saying, it's been getting a little difficult. Uh, my question is, uh, do I need to get hearing aids? Yeah, good question. And as as we get older, we tend to lose some of the um, the frequencies, particularly if you're exposed to lou- louder sounds when you're younger. You tend to lose some of that acuity with being able to pick those up. And unfortunately, that's sort of in the range of normal conversation, particularly if it's in a situation where there's other things going on. The TV's going on, you're in a crowded restaurant, um, and multiple people talking to you at the same time. So at 69, I would say, based on those symptoms, you at least need to be evaluated formally. And the reason I would say that is because there are some other conditions that can cause hearing loss and ringing in your ears that may need a little bit different treatment. And one of those is Meniere's disease. Um, and that occurs in as you get older uh, and is often accompanied by uh, ringing in your ears, decreased hearing loss, and you can have some vertigo component to that too. In other words, feeling like the room is spinning. But, um, but anyway, I would I would do that and to quantify the frequencies of hearing loss that you have. And um, it, the trick with hearing aids, hearing aids would be great, and it would probably allow you to communicate better with the people around you. But you do need to, you know, there's there's these sort of cheaper brands that you can get online or, or somewhere. That's not going to be the best thing for you. And sometimes that can make your symptoms worse, particularly if you're having ringing in your ears. Some of the newer hearing aids are great. And actually, they can link up with your phone where you can change like in different situations. Like you can have noise canceling ability. If you're in a crowded restaurant, there would be a crowded restaurant option that you could just tap on your phone. It sends a signal straight to your hearing aids, and then it has the appropriate sort of muffling effect so that you can hear the people at your table or your waiter when they come up. So um, uh, I would suggest doing that, but I would I would look into, because they're expensive, look into your insurance on that and look into uh, you know, if Medicare is going to going to cover that or other insurances, because you want to know that first, because they can be pretty expensive. We're talking five, ten thousand dollars sometimes with hearing aids. So you do want to, okay. you know, you do want to check that out first um, to make sure you understand that. But I would, I, I am a big proponent of that. I mean, it is terribly frustrating for people who have lose, lost hearing uh, over time 
to uh, to socialize with people, to really get to, you know, to have that ability to talk to people and to communicate. It really cuts into that. Uh, and there are, are some studies that have linked or at least associated hearing loss with dementia. And uh, one of the theories behind that is that loss of social stimulation because you can't adequately communicate with people. So that I, I would I would move in that direction. Just make sure you got all the facts on how much it's going to cost and those kinds of things. Okay, doctor. Thank you. All right, Jim. Thanks for calling. This is Southern Remedy. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning. We are taking your calls right now, that number to call if you have any type of question about any topic related to your health care, the health care of someone near and dear to you. Just dial one eight seven seven MPB ring. That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Kevin, we should we should do a study on if you say dial in, how much that correlates to your age. Because every time I, I say that, I think, yeah, when's the last time somebody dialed something? So that's taken me back to the eighties with that twenty foot cord that came off the phone in the kitchen. That's also dating me as well. Let's go to Tony from Georgia. Good morning, Tony. Hey, good morning, Dr. Jimmy. Thank you very much. Okay, some quick background. I am 68 <laughs> years old, and I am under a doctor's care. But my question is dealing with blood pressure. Mm-hmm. I, uh, mm-hmm. I take I take lisinopril once daily, and I think it's 20 milligrams mm-hmm. once daily. And uh, I take it in the morning with other medication. But my blood pressure tends to run uh, around 110 over the Mm mid-50s. And that is is consistent throughout the day. And it's been going on for quite some time. And uh, my doctor is aware of it. And when I'm, you know, I, I recently, I just had a checkup about two months ago. And, uh, you know, and I made him aware of it. And while I was there, he took my blood pressure uh, under several different situations, standing up, sitting down, laying down, and several times during the office visit. But uh, but I just wanted to get some feedback from you, what you think about. Yeah. My symptoms. Yeah, that's a common question if you have hypertension and are treated for it. Like, what what is a good blood pressure range? And sometimes that depends on the individual patient and sort of factors going into it. So at your age, and I believe you said 68, was that right? Did I hear that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, one of the things I do is exactly, you got a good doctor because most doctors would not go to the extra precaution of taking blood multiple blood pressures like that. So the reason for doing that is we want to make sure that your blood pressure is not dropping too low when you're going from lying down flat to sitting up or sitting up to standing. And normally it would not drop, right? When it does drop, what that tells us is you're not perfusing your brain with a blood pressure that's high enough to stay awake. And that puts you at risk for a fall. We also ask questions like, are you having difficulty where you feel like you're almost blacking out when you're getting up? Uh, are you lightheaded at all? And a little bit of that's okay, you know, when you sort of jump up and um, you may have a couple of seconds where you feel like your blood pressure is a little lower. That's okay, but we're talking about the ones where you're going to fall out and pass out because that could be bad. Um So the things that he was doing in the office, your physician was uh, trying to tease out, is your blood pressure getting too low? Now, both numbers, as far as risk of heart attack or stroke or any other thing that's related to blood pressure risk, including kidney damage, are tied to the top number, which is the systolic, and the bottom number, which is the diastolic. So we look at both of those. But as you get older... We, we really look at, again, both of those to make sure that it's not getting too low. But the bottom number, it, once it gets below 60, and particularly in somebody who's over the age of 65, I start to get a little nervous about that because that lower number, if it's below 60, means that you're a little bit higher risk for having pass down episodes. Um, now, I think it would be perfectly fine if all those testing, if those blood pressures in the office were fine, if you don't have any of those symptoms, just to watch this a little bit longer, we know that a lower blood pressure, even if as you get older, can be beneficial 
in um, particularly with stroke risk, but also with heart disease risk as well. So um, there's there's all kinds of benefits from that, but we do have to balance that out. Like there's there are some lower numbers, and again, that's individualized. I have some patients that can't tolerate when their diastolic that lower number gets much lower than seventy. Um, so I, there's nothing I can do about that. We just try to, to balance it out. And there's no blood pressure medication that can just treat the top number uh, alone or the bottom number alone. But I think it would be reasonable to cut back on the dose of lisinopril. Um, that if, if you're continuing to be um, concerned about it, there's no good treatment data other than to, to say at the blood pressure that you're at, like let's say that you cut that dose in half. So if you're instead of taking 20 milligrams of lisinopril, you cut it back to 10 milligrams a day, then um, your blood pressure, let's say it went up to say 120 over 80. There's nothing to say that that higher blood pressure when compared to what your blood pressure is right now is going to be that much more protective. We know that a treatment blood pressure less than 130 over 80 is very protective. If you had heart failure, we know that a blood pressure maybe even lower than that, um, that's probably the group of patients where we treat blood pressure to very low levels to try to, to give the heart a little bit of a, uh, a break on having to work so hard. But I would continue to have that conversation with your physician. Sounds like you got a good one and they're doing all the right things, but I think it would be reasonable for you to cut back the dose to a half of what you're taking right now. But don't do that without talking to your physician because there may be some other reasons why they want to keep it at 20. Um, But if you have any of those dizzy spells or lightheadedness, you need to call their office right quick, and uh, they may may suggest going uh, cutting back on that medication dose. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I I appreciate the program. Yes, sir. Thank you for listening and calling in. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning, answering your questions and calls about any kind of health care issue that you might have an interest in. Or if you'd like to email us, the email address is uh, remedy at mpbonline.org. And sometimes I know a lot of people are like, hey, I just caught the last 10 minutes of your show or I caught the, the latter half of a question that you were answering and really wanted to go back and listen to it. Is there a way to do that? Yes, there is. If you're asking that question, you can just search for Southern Remedy uh, on any uh, of your favorite podcasting apps and uh, you can subscribe to that and uh, download us and listen to us whenever you want um, on the fly. So that's a good way to catch up on the entirety of that. And that also extends to our other MPB, um, MPB Think Radio uh, programs. So we do that for you so that you can have access to those uh, whenever you need it. So check that out. I had a conversation a little bit earlier about um, lactose intolerance. And that's something that a lot of people deal with. And it's something that you can acquire throughout your life. And basically, foods, dairy foods, um, have a sugar in them called lactose. And normally, our bodies produce enzymes to break down sugars. And, um, and that's important to, uh, for two different reasons. One is you need to, if you're going to digest that and use that as energy, it has to be broken down in a form that it can be absorbed in, through the, abdom- the uh, intestinal wall into your blood system, and then utilized by the body for whatever energy needs that it has. The other thing is that if it's not broken down, then you can have some side effects from that extra sugar in the interior of your intestine. And those side effects can be bloating. They can be diarrhea. Uh, Sometimes in severe cases, they can even be bloody, particularly if you have a true allergy uh, to lactose products. And again, that's all lactose containing products. So that's going to be milk and its various, uh, forms. So milk and really doesn't have anything true. Lactose intolerance doesn't have anything to do with the amount of fat in milk. So I know a lot of people say, well, I got 2%. Doesn't that protect me? Well, it does. If you, if you can't handle big fat loads, um, and that is a problem too. Sometimes, sometimes you can have some of the same symptoms if you have whole milk, versus 2% or 1% or skim milk. 
but it truly is the ability to break down that sugar. And as we age, we lose that. Um, a, a lot of people lose that. Even if you loved milk when you were a kid or a young adult and you drank a lot of it, there may come a time when you lose the ability to break down that uh, lactose molecule in your intestine. And uh, another, um, uh, really, what do you do about that? Well, the only thing you can do is two, two choices, either uh, avoid those foods or you can take something like lactate, which contains the enzyme you need to break that down, and you just take it with the food. It actually has some, you can get it over the counter. It's got some instructions right there about how to do it. If you really, 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 really enjoy that food, that, that it has lactose in it. The other thing uh, to keep in mind is if you have any type of infection in your intestines, and this is this would be like a, a GI, we call it a GI bug, but a, a gastroenteritis, the enteritis part of that, where you have diarrhea for a couple of days because you caught a viral infection uh, or other infections that give you chronic diarrhea, that uh, can make you lactose intolerant because the cells that help produce that enzyme are right on the tip of what we call the villi. The villi is sort of what, uh, it's like a, a, a bumpy road map on the interior of the, um, of the uh, intestines. And that enzyme is right on the tip of that villi on the interior surface. And when you have an infection, you sort of shear off those cells so they get sort of washed away, and you, you can temporarily lose the ability to break down lactose-containing products because of that. So that's a very common thing. You know, we used to think, you know, milk's a great, it is a great uh, source of protein, great source of calcium. Uh, it's fortified often with dot vitamin D, so it certainly it's very good, very useful in kids and in making uh, formulas. But... Usually, um, most people are going to lose that ability if they live long enough, and that's just a fact of life. We don't typically need milk. Um, there's other other sources of that. And uh, that does not extend to things like almond milk or uh, I'm blanking on so soy milk. Um, so those don't have that, that sugar in it. So it's a little bit different form of, of sugar that your body can break down. Uh, but that's that's sort of lactose intolerance. So a quick follow up on that one, Doctor Jimmy. So it's um, it's all dairy products. So if you had it, whether it be milk, cheese, ice cream, yogurt. I mean, does it is it vary? Or is, uh, does milk have more lactose in it than say cheese? No, it's about the same amount of lactose. But it is interesting. Some people can tolerate one and not the other, and that's the thought that it might be. You know, it's not an all or none thing. It's not like, okay, I've lost all my enzyme activity for breaking down lactose. Sometimes it can be to the, how much you're getting. Um, so, and in, in the form that you're getting it. So if you can tolerate cheeses or things that are heated up even, uh, sometimes that breaks down the, the proteins and the other molecules in there. It usually doesn't break down the sugars to that extent, but that can help too. Like some people say, well, I cook with milk. But in that situation, you're heating it up and you're breaking down some of those things so that you're not being exposed to it. So, um, And the other part of that is the fat content because, again, eating too much fats at once and types of fats, uh, and some people will say, oh, that explains everything. Like certain types of foods, I know if I eat them, then that's going to increase my symptoms of bloating and so forth. But um, I, I tell people, hey, Eat a little bit of what, don't like eat milk products every meal if you're trying to figure this out. Just eat a milk product one meal. Write down what symptoms you have with that and how long you have them. Uh, and then uh, you might, a couple of days later, try something else. Like if you start off with milk, then you can go to cheese in a couple of days and just see if you have the similar symptoms and then again, if avoidance is probably the easiest thing to do. There's not really any tests that you need to do to prove this. Uh, we don't routinely do that in the office. It's mainly, hey, just avoid that product um, uh, of what you're eating if you can. If you can't and you're like, no, I am not giving up my milk, <laughs> or you're a dairy farmer, then you need, <laughs> then you might need to think about you know, just taking the lactate. It is something else to take, but it's certainly very easy to take. Um, and uh, it can help decrease those symptoms. This is Southern Remedy. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning. 
had a previous caller talk about blood pressure management and targets. You know, the other thing to keep in mind, too, for most people, uh, our previous caller uh, did not require very many blood pressure medications. Just one, it's sort of a medium dose or maybe even a starting dose for adults of, of lisinopril in his case. Um, but uh, still a misconception that I see out there is there's that you should be able to be controlled by one blood pressure medication. And that's not true. Um, so we have a lot of data to suggest for if, for you to get to a goal blood pressure, which again, for most people with hypertension, that's getting to at least less than 130 over 80 consistently. And that is measured by both uh, office home, uh, blood pressure measurement and also it's helpful to have home blood pressure management too. Uh, so less than 130 over 80, but to get there, most people are going to have to be on two to three medications, whether they're combined together, like we have what's what we call fixed dose combinations, where we have, say, lisinopril combined with hydrochlorothiazide, or we might have some other combinations uh, of different classes of, of uh, blood pressure medications. But two to three is about what it takes to get most people to their goal blood pressure. So don't think just because you're on one that you need to jump ship and go to a different one. You probably need to add something to that. And what I tell patients is, hey, our, our, my number one goal is to get you to that goal blood pressure. But if we can do it with as few medications, as few side effects, and not break the bank in doing that with copays, then that's our goal. And it needs to be a simple regimen too. I know there's a lot of regimens out there where you have to take blood pressure medications two, maybe three times a day. And I try to steer away from that because that is very difficult to get somebody that's regimented enough to do some, to take medication three times a day. And there are other alternatives out there that uh, are much smoother and longer acting where you only have to take them once a day. So just keep that in mind if you're having questions or you're thinking, oh, I don't know if I should be on, maybe I should just be on one blood pressure. That sounds like this guy was for was uh, fairly well controlled. So just because somebody else is controlled on one or three doesn't mean that that's going to apply to you. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning answering your uh, calls and questions about any kind of healthcare topic that you're interested in. And sometimes you get a diagnosis and you're like, I didn't quite understand all of that. Or do I, what are my options uh, this is your chance to get a little bit more information about that. So we try to help out uh, in giving you that or pointing you in the right direction of where you need to go. So, you know, I do, uh, we see a lot of kids and adults sometimes with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or uh, if you don't have hyper hyperactivity, sometimes it's just attention deficit disorder. And the question usually comes up with a lot of people, either you have patients or their, their families come in and say, hey, we want to treat this with medication if that's what they've got. Uh, and then some that say, is medication really necessary? And you really do have to have a, a com- combined approach to this that does take into effect how do you approach things and, and what are you doing? Like some people are in jobs or they're in school where they really have to focus in on uh, certain things to do well, or they may have, you know, that job that requires the same amount of focus and some not so much, or their job may provide them with the social structures where they can break up long projects, where they, um, where they move quickly from one thing to the other. Uh, But medication sometimes is needed as an adjunct to that um, to adequately treat. Well, there was a study that was just published in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association that was looking at an association between what's called all-cause mortality. So that's death by any, any means in patients that have ADHD who were treated or untreated with medication. And what they found is that in that group that was treated, that there was a significantly lower all-cause mortality, particularly deaths when they broke it down that were caused by accidental poisoning, suicide, or accidental injury. So this makes a lot of sense if you think about it. So adequate control of the symptoms of ADHD. You know, sometimes we see ADHD patients and they have overlapping other mental illnesses like depression or anxiety uh, that are sort of in a, in a feedback loop with those symptoms of ADHD. 
So treating ADHD can help sometimes in those other symptoms. So that makes a lot of sense. And it's also something that, that hopefully if you're on the, if you know, if you're on the, on the fence about that with your son or daughter, or maybe yourself and thinking, I, I don't know if I've, I've got the diagnosis and that's an important thing in getting an accurate diagnosis. Cause sometimes patients come in and say, I have ADHD. And then you do all the screening and testing and you're like, well, actually you may have something different. Uh, so that is important in getting the, the right diagnosis, but medication and medication in the long term can be beneficial uh, depending on that individual patient. We're going to go to Ed from Tallulah, Louisiana. Good morning, Ed. Good morning. My, my question pertains to tachycardias. Yeah. Um, when the heart starts, well, you know what that is when it starts racing. Is there any uh, thing you can do while it's occurring to stop it other than the vagal processes? Is there a medication that could take to subdue it or... Only in a, yeah, so, so let me back up a little bit because you've seemed to know, uh, you know, about tachycardia. Uh, So tachycardia just means fast heart rate and you can have in really it's caused by a number of things. So there, it could be, you know, just something that comes up. It could be caused by um, structural changes within your heart. It could be caused by different uh, uh, other uh, conditions like heart failure. But whatever the cause, sometimes if it's if it's fast enough for long enough, it can do some damage just because you're not able to to perfuse the rest of your body if it's too fast. Uh, to your specific question, is there anything you can do right in the moment other than the vagal maneuvers? And those can be very um, effective. And when he says vagal maneuvers, those are things like, and we teach this in the clinic. Uh, in the office or hospital, like you, you, there are certain places where you can place a finger or a hand and press um, um, firmly against, particularly in the neck, that stimulates the um, receptor um, to decrease your heart rate. And sometimes that is effective in sort of breaking that cycle. The other thing is like cold water on the face um, uh, or immersion even uh, can, uh, can do that. But outside of those, and those are useful things that you can do if you're out and about and you notice that, that it is it is quicker. Medications can decrease it, and we often give those, but they need to be given in a supervised fashion. So in other words, in the ER, in the hospital, we and in some situations, the clinic. Um, but those are sort of temporizing things, and, um, you know, we don't the cardiologists don't like to prescribe a lot of those if it is um, in situations where you're just at home and you feel you've got a fast heart rate? Do you just give it right then and there? There's some great monitoring of uh, the heart. You know, we used to have these big bulky Holter monitors where you basically it's like getting an EKG and then you wear this big box uh, in a sling or you know sort of a backpack around for about two you know a week or two. Um, to capture these different arrhythmias. Now they have a, a little device called a Zio patch and that's Z-I-O um, that um, it's very small. You just tape it to your chest and it um, measures the EKG continuously. You can correlate it with the symptoms that you're having. And depending on how often you have those, it can capture exactly what's going on. And the reason that's helpful is we don't treat every fast heart rate the same depending on what's causing it. And sometimes seeing an electrophysiologist, which is a super specialized cardiologist, uh, can be very helpful in determining whether a long-term medication or other interventions like a catheterization to try to see what parts of the heart are are behaving badly, so to speak, uh, and firing off when they shouldn't. And then if none of that works, then you're talking about, you know, sort of a pacemaker and those have gotten a lot better in having some variability to, to allow you to do what you need to do. So probably too much information, Ed, but that's, yeah, to answer your question directly, there are medications that you can use, but typically we don't use those uh, outside of a very controlled environment because sometimes bad things can happen around giving those that you have to be aware of and have to uh, have some backup. And In an unstable patient with a fast heart rate, depending on what that fast heart rate is, sort of our last straw is uh, cardioversion, which is the paddles on the chest and doing the shock. Uh, So AEDs are a great tool, and those are automatic 
uh, electronic defibrillators, and you'll see these at schools, at uh, different public places. I bet we've got one at MPB. And uh, Kevin's shaking his head yes. So um, if something happens, these devices, you can uh, follow the directions, take it out, put uh, the paddles or the the, uh, the leads on the, te- on the chest, and it'll tell you exactly uh, whether or not it is appropriate to shock or not. Uh, so those have saved a lot of lives because it's really about, um, you know, getting that help quickly. But again, we don't typically send those home with patients. Um, those are in public places. If you're, you know, worried enough to where you're doing that, then I think you would be seeing a cardiologist that would be talking about, do we need a pacemaker or do we need different medications? Uh, we definitely have a cardiologist. Uh, it's been going on for a long time. I didn't notice, uh, Well, I noted that before we knew about all the different bagel responses that we could go through, that when an IV was started, it would subdue it immediately. And I think it's related to the fluids, like you said, water. Yeah. Water, cold water does stop it. Right. And sometimes even pain. uh, Now, it wouldn't inflict pain on anybody. But, uh, you know, when you have a painful uh, stimulus the the normally the heart in you, most people would think well doesn't it get faster yeah but that first response is a vagal response and that can sort of interrupt anytime the vagus nerve is is sort of in a vagal response heart rate decreases it's also why patients who don't have fast heart rates and sometimes they pass out if they're stimulating the vagal system so Going to the bathroom is a good example of that. So you're asleep at night, you walk out and you go to the bathroom, you pass out or you get scared or you, uh, you know, you're shocked by something that you see. The reason why some people pass out is because they have that vagal response, which decreases their heart rate. They don't perfuse their brain enough and then they pass out. And usually that's, you know, short lived, but um, that's. That is the reflex that you're going for that can sort of interrupt that fast heart rate. Yeah, right now, most of the time when he bears down real hard and clinches, yep. that's how he gets out of it. Yep, so. and that is that is a very useful tool, sort of old school, but that's what we had, you know, 50 years ago. So that's it's still very useful. I've done that with patients in the hospital. It's been a while since I did it on a patient but that, or in the clinic for that matter. But, um, but yeah, it, it can be very useful if you know what you're doing. Well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you. All right, Ed, thank you for listening and calling. We do appreciate it. This is Southern Remedy. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning answering your questions about any kind of healthcare topic that you might be interested in. We talk a lot about exercise on Southern Remedy, and certainly, um, you know, there's an old sort of mantra that is exercise is medicine, and it that's true, and food is medicine in some ways. And there's no doubt that if you get a regular, um, if you have a regular regimen of physical activity, that it has a lot of health benefits like uh, controlling your weight, reducing stress, boosting your mood, uh, increasing your circulation, decreasing your risk of cardiovascular disease, and lowering cancer is also on the list. Um, and exercise is one of those tools that um, you can cut your risk for almost every cancer. Then it's certainly in our governmental guidelines and recommendations from professional groups but uh, the you know if you think that's going to be a cure all cuz i do find patients and they're like i don't understand i was exercising like to the max it was benefiting me from every different uh, angle and still i got uh, i got cancer so uh, what's with that so it's not a complete absence of risk and you do have to take into account depending on the type of cancer things like family history other environmental factors of things that you're being exposed to. Um, so it is, a, the data is a little bit uncertain. And um, certainly if you're just talking about every cancer, there are some that are, um, that definitely have it a benefit. Now, I don't want you to just say, okay, well, Dr. Jimmy said, don't exercise. It's not going to help you. So uh, again, there are multiple things that you can do. But when you talk about, you know, sometimes I've heard this to say, If you want to reduce your risk of cancer, just go exercise. And that's not entirely true. There are other things that you need to do to reduce that risk. And it's a little bit um, unclear about how that exercise helps out to reduce your risk in most cases. Now, if you combine that with, say, eating a healthy diet, that's great. And there's certainly a little bit more evidence on 
in what you're eating, which can be attributable to lowering your risk of cancer. So it's always a good idea to eat better and increase your physical activity or maintain your physical activity um, to, uh, to live a healthier life. And it's not just about living longer. It's about the quality, too. You know, speaking of cardiovascular disease, a lot of people will say, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I know my cholesterol is a little high, but um, w- what does that have to do with me taking any medication for that? Can I not just sort of skip that option? I know there have been some, um, you know, some patients that are concerned about some of the side effects with some of the medications, uh, particularly the group called the statins, and that's things like atorvastatin or rosuvastatin. Um, but there are large benefits, particularly in groups of people who have increased risk of cardiovascular disease, which is why we sort of plug all those things in. And, uh, I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. There's a a new, uh, tool that the American Heart Association just rolled out that you can, uh, assess your risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, over the next 10 years and lifetime. And, um, Reducing those risks is very important, and part of that, not all of it, but part of that is reducing your cholesterol, particularly your non-HDL cholesterol. And I know a lot of people who are a lot smarter than me say, hey, that you're really missing the point. There's other types of cholesterol that's much more of a problem, and that is true. But when you're talking about the entire population and getting a good risk assessment, um, we know that statins will decrease your risk if you're um, in that higher risk group. And by that, I mean anything over about 7.5% um, in the next 10 years. And that's fairly high if you think about it. Um, that that can cut that risk at least in half. And uh, that's pretty significant. And uh, it's a very predictable decrease. Um, again, some people do have some side effect symptoms like muscle aches or fatigue when they're taking the statins, there are a few patients that I've had that have had true uh, allergies or they've had a, a statin-induced myopathy from that. But that, again, tends to be very rare, and these medications uh, continue to be very useful tools in reducing your risk. And uh, a lot of cholesterol, um, particularly if you come in and you do a, a fasting sample, um, you know, it's, it's not that modifiable from what you eat and exercise. You might, um, you know, increase your HDL, that's that healthy uh, cholesterol, or decrease your LDL, that's the lousy cholesterol. That's not the actual terms uh, for them, but that's the way I use those terms to help patients remember them. Um, exercise and diet alone doesn't always impact that because there is a strong genetic component of that. Um, and you may, may be doing everything right, but still have uh, those levels where they are. We're going to go to Phil from Brandon. Good morning, Phil. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I was uh, diagnosed last July with chronic lymphatic leukemia, CLL. Mm-hmm. Yep. Was brand new to me, but uh, presently the oncologist recommends that I am a watch and wait mode. In other yep. words, no, no, no treatment. Right. What can I do to mitigate or help along my white blood cell count? Yeah, great question. So CLL is one of those cancers of the of the blood cells, and uh, it's in the leukemias um, or or lymphomas, and it is uh, one that is you could have that for twenty, maybe thirty years, and not have any problems. So it's one of the better ones to have as far as longevity. Unfortunately, there's not much you can do to sort of support those white blood cells. Now, what we just talked about about living healthy, you know, choosing good stuff to eat. Uh, fruits and vegetables, mostly unprocessed foods and getting regular physical activity can be very helpful uh, in doing that. But it's not like you can sort of boost them in being uh, a little bit more healthy. I certainly wouldn't pick up any bad habits like smoking, um, although that's not been linked very much to this, to my knowledge. Um, but the biggest thing is just making sure that you're sort of watching and waiting and somebody's looking at that. Uh, over time. And again, I've had a lot of patients with CLL and they've done really well for decades uh, with the same type of regimen. Well, I really appreciate your, uh, your input. That's kind of the impression I already had. 
but I was hoping. To, <laughs> <you know. laughs> I don't have a magic bullet, Phil. I wish I did for that, but uh, yeah, I would. Now, if it were me, I would certainly try to eat right and, and stay stay active. I mean, the other thing to think about, if it did what we call transform, if it does get to the point where you'd have to have medication for it or treatment for it, you would want to be in your best health that you possibly could getting up to that. So that's another reason to look at your overall health going into it, not just the white blood cells. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm in pretty good shape except for this. All right. Now, they, they told me that 10.5 was like the uh, normal threshold for mm-hmm. the type of white blood cell they're measuring. Right. Mine is 13.5, and then two or three months later, I managed to get it to 12.5. Is that just going to be a variable? Yeah, uh, it's going to kind of float like that. Right, it's going to go up and down, and that's sort of nor- even in people who have normal uh, lymphocytic uh, counts, uh, they'll see uh, it go up and down. If you got sick with, let's say, a viral infection, I would expect it to go up with that. Um, but that that variation, that's a very small variation and shouldn't be attributable to any one thing. So don't get depressed if it goes up, you know, to even 14 or if it comes down to nine. You know, I wouldn't quite celebrate. I'd be happy with what I got, but it, it may be variable over that time period. Okay. Are you aware of a particular threshold on that count when... Uh would be uh, uh, you know recommended yeah there are some there's a sort of an algorithm that the hematologists go to to um, to determine whether or not to start therapy so I would sort of defer to them but they're not and it may also take into account other health things that you have sort of in the background uh, and age so I would just sort of defer to them because there's all kinds of new protocols that are coming out yeah it seems like it's a uh, uh, emerging technology now. Oh, absolutely. And treatment for that, if you do have to have it, is a lot more tolerable than what we used to have. Yeah, they tell me they quit doing chemotherapy on it right. about two years ago. Right. It was not effective. Hey, uh, I thank you so much for taking my call. All right, Phil. Thank you. I appreciate you listening and calling in. That's all the time we have for today. I do want to thank everybody for calling in. Southern Remedies are a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio and is funded in part by a grant from the University of Mississippi Medical Center. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at UMMC. Southern Remedies is produced by Kevin Farrell, and the podcast producer is Abram Nanny. Tune in to MPB Think Radio every weekday morning at 11 for the full Southern Remedy lineup. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.